Hello, how are you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's it with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. How the devil are you? Oh, it's, it's good to say that again. I bet you thought, oh, he's never going to say that again. We're never, I'm not going to come back. Of course we were going to come back. But we had to have a break. Well, I, I had to have a break um, for all sorts of reasons. But here's the thing, right? If I can't do this to the best of my ability uh, and, and bring you, you know, hopefully good, fantastic, interesting episodes, then um, I'm just not going to do it. And I was burnt out and I kind of needed just to take a bit of time out just to to look after myself and get better. And now we are back. I'm sat here in a flat in Manchester. The beautiful producer Griff is just to my left. Um, He's got some very nice new kit, which we've just recorded an episode with the amazing Morven Christie. Now, as we go into it, we have been discussing this for such a long time, and I know she's been a name that's been banded around on social media asking us to come on. But over the last few weeks, I've set up uh, a a lot of brilliant, interesting people that are going to come on and have a natter. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to carry on doing what we do, bringing you these episodes into our second year, the second Two Shot Pod year, and the rest of the year is going to be a belter, trust me. So I want to say a massive thank you for all your lovely emails, your messages of support on social media, and your uh, sort of trust and, you know, the, the amount of people that have said, you know, look, we'll miss you, but just you, you take all the time that you need and then come back. I hope we haven't taken too long. I don't think so. I, to be honest, it does seem like a bloody long time since I've done it. And, and uh, I was a bit nervous about coming back because, you know, you, you get off the horse and you don't know whether you can still ride it. That's a fucking terrible analogy, but you, you know where I'm going with it. Um, but we're back and it feels really, really good. And I'm thrilled to bring you um, this incredible episode with Morven Christie. This is, it's around an hour and 20 minutes and there is not a moment wasted. It's, it, of course, as with all the episodes, we don't follow a pattern. It's a, it's a conversation and you, we touch on some very, it goes deep very quickly as per, um, through through no signposting of either myself or Morvan. It just kind of happened in the, the most lovely, organic way possible. And I'm so pleased that we did. Um, we touch on some really important issues and we really get to know who Morvan is, where she's been, and more importantly, where she is now. So sit yourself down or get on the treadmill. Whatever you're doing, get on the train, block all those other people out because this... I'm very, very happy to say, is episode 87 of the Two Shot Podcast with the amazing Morven Christie. I'll see you in a bit. I think that would drive me fucking mad. You can concentrate. It's great that locations put on us on a flight path. Oh. I've had that before. And it's like every I mean, few minutes. Oh. <laughs> I just... If I could just get through two lines in a run, that'd be great. Just two... Like, I've lowered my expectations that far. Does it just not your concentration? It's not that. It's the momentum, you know? Like, it's... You you don't move through the day and you just watch everyone get sort of de-energised and that kind of, like, the way of, like, oh, God, you know, the first day he's, like, fucking tearing his hair out, he's got an app in his hand, like, he's watching the planes and he's, like, you know, and everyone's just kind of... It's that thing, that thing of, like, there not being a drive through the day. Okay, we've done that. Next shot, yeah. done that. Next shot, scene complete. Next, like that, that thing that I love about filming, the pace of it going. And it just know? kind of wears everybody yeah. down and just, drains all their energy. Yeah. I was thinking the other day when we were talking about getting together and doing this, mm. when how long we've been actually talking about I was trying to you doing it out. I think it's, it's over been, a year. Yeah, it's been a while. 
Because I think it's been quite a lot longer than that, you know? Yeah, because Dan, Ryan, like I did that job with Dan. We're coming up to about to start the second series, which is exactly the same dates. That starts in August. And I think we'd been talking about it for a good year before Dan had the conversation with me. Because I think we, me and you were talking about this at the very start, and this is our second year now yeah. of episodes. And it was well before Dan. Because I remember when Dan said that he got that job with you. Yeah. And prior to that, when he was on the podcast, he wasn't having a particularly great He was great having a bit of a shit time. time, wasn't he? So yeah. I was really pleased that all these nice things started to happen for him. Because, mm. you know... When the good things happen to the nice ones, I know, you right? go, oh, that's great because it doesn't happen all the time, does it? I know. I think that's one of the hardest things about this industry is like the sense of injustice that seems to surround things all the time. Like you're constantly, like I've done some jobs with some real cunts in the last couple of years, you know, and it's like, fuck, you're doing really well and you're a horrible yeah. cunt, mm. you know? And and just, like, the sense of injustice of that, like, really plagues me. It's something that I've really struggled with for years. So that thing of, like, when, yeah, when a good person, when stuff starts to come together, you're like, yeah. okay, the universe is not all bad. Well, this not is... only when it's the nice people, but the ones that go, oh, you, oh, you actually deserve it. Yes. And, and are you a big fighter for the injustice? Yeah. And I only said it because I used to be. And it used to not put me in people's good books. Right. See, interestingly, I used to pipe down. Like, I would totally just, like, keep it zipped, mm. just be, like, pissed about it. Well, internalise it and actually just end up feeling, like, really depressed and really, like, turning it all around on myself. And I've only started really piping up since I've been in a slightly more... Elevated um, position. Elevated, yeah. Where, where I, I mean that in, an, I mean that yeah, in, a, in a, a nice it's, way. But it's true. It's like, yeah. I can say stuff now and people will actually go, oh... Cool. Yeah, no, no, you're absolutely sorry. Sorry about that. We won't, you know. And, but it's it's much easier because I'm speaking up for other people. Like, people don't deck around with me in the way that they would have done four or five years ago on set. Like, I don't really get... It. And that's interesting as well. It makes you really judge people. It's like, ooh, you were not this nice to me three years ago. This is interesting. What's this about? Like, do you know what I mean? Which is weird. It's weird and creepy. It's but it, like again, it says so much more about that person than it would do 100%. about where you are. Because even though you're saying now, what I, I feel because I've got, I don't want to say power. I don't want to say that, but that's not what it's I just mean. Just I'm on it's, a bit of a run. If you're on a bit of a run that, yeah. and people listen to you a bit more, you feel that you can stand up. And fight that injustice. I, yeah. th- I think that's healthy. But that's the thing is, you haven't changed. No. So that person who is very different to you now than they were three years ago, that's on them. Yeah. It's funny though, I wonder how much the process of sort of like self editing, like of silencing yourself, actually does make you a bit of a different person. Like I feel way more me now at work than I felt five years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, like, I'm not a different person, but I'm also not going, well, I can't fucking say that out loud, so I'm going to just go home and feel like I fucking hate this industry. Well, it's because you're you're probably not repressing it and you're not internalising it, taking it home with you and then releasing and dealing with all that shit that you thought, why didn't I say that at work today? Exactly. Why did that person speak to that person like a piece of shit? Yeah, exactly. You're just spotting it in the moment and going, hey, don't do that. Please don't do that. That's not okay. And then it's gone, and you don't have to carry it about. Mm. So it just and, and it's a lot kind of dealt freer. with. You it, exactly. It's yeah. It freer. doesn't touch the sides. It's like oh, that's just it's taken in the moment and dealt with, and then you can just but, live. But isn't it funny because um, what we do is all built on communication on a set. It's all about communication, yeah. right? And when that lack of communication <laughs> flatlines. Is, is ridiculous and you go well what the train stopped yeah. we're not at the destination yet yeah. what's going on yeah and it's so common isn't it well if people don't talk they have to talk yeah because otherwise the job don't get done I know there's a really weird culture of sort of like transparency like or lack of transparency as well on set that some, on some sets that I find really difficult this kind of like the need to know basis thing of like you know things like schedules or or we're changing this, or, oh, can I just ask why? Or, you know, that kind of, like, 
just not telling each other things, not sharing information, as if we're all on different teams. <laughs> yeah. Rather than all trying, like, we're all on the same fucking side, trying to well, make the same we're all, thing. We're all trying to do the same job, so don't... Right? If you start with the hierarchy, it gets between us and them. Mm. Awful. <sighs> Awful. It's, that is not healthy. No. Because then you've got some people who are going off into one camp and the revolution's about to happen because they they feel that they're mm. not being given the information mm. that they need to do their job to the best of their ability. And they go, well, we can't can't tell the children that. Can't yeah. tell. And it becomes like that. And, it's like... and then you get like, you get like, so if it's actors, you get, you get like the actors that get along really well with the, you know, that are kind of in with the people that are, and then the other actors have a judgment on them. And then, yeah. I mean, I do. I'm like, oh, right, okay, you're right up our arse, aren't you? <laughs> like, I hate that. Um, I what? just think like, if if you just open everything up, you put some faith in people, it changes the whole environment. The whole day just like goes quicker. You know that thing at the end of the day when you start a day on set and it's like slow as fuck, and it'll really sort of laborious and whatever. And then yeah. and then you get to the end of the day and it's like go 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 go, fucking panic and right, everyone's you've got 20 like twenty minutes, yeah, and, it, and it's all on you. They, I was I was doing a take of a, a close up the other night and and um, and. One of the sparks from outside went, I, I was just about to start the take and, and one of the sparks went, can I just run in and fix something? And the, and the first AD went, no, there's four seconds to go. Four fucking seconds to go, he said. And I went, okay. And, and he went, right, action. And I did this take and I sort of like fluffed the words. And I was like, I'm really sorry. See that four seconds? It just became two minutes because now I need another take. <laughs> sorry. But if you have let him... Gone and done yeah, his job. If you'd have just breathed on what we were doing <laughs> yeah. and let everyone do it, we all know what the time is. We all know where we are. Let's just like stop fucking yelling at each other and get it done. And then. And if needs be, if everybody asks politely, I'm sure we can just go over half an hour and even it will be, we'll be done in 15 minutes, yeah. but just get it done. And then it'll be the best it can be. Why settle? Mm. If it's fixable, why settle for it not being the best it could possibly I be. I totally think that, but I also totally think if you're not screaming at people, you'll get it done in the time. Uh, uh, well, people work yeah. better when they're not being fucking yelled at. Well, of course <laughs> they do. This happened to me, and I, I was off the set on a job once, and I was very close with the, the, the runner and the makeup girls, and we, got, we had a great, great dialogue, and they were yeah. just dead, dead sound. And I was off, and then someone said to me, some, and I heard my name and I went, what, what do you say? And these, these were the friends of mine on the crew. They went, oh, the first just told uh, this runner, I won't say her name because I wouldn't want to embarrass her, <laughs> to, uh, to fuck off in front of like the rest of the crew. Oh, no. no. And I was having a particularly emotional day at work anyway. So when that happened and I found that out, I was fucking raging and I spoke to the girl in question she went please don't say anything oh that and they always said, do said, and you're said, like said, no, no but the thing gonna... is the thing is had I have been there on the set at that moment I would have said something yeah. there and then I said but if it happens again and he was particularly a highly strong as well this first and I thought if that happens again and I'm there I can't not say anything no, because agreed. you can't humiliate and embarrass people like that. It doesn't matter that you're a first... And it's always on someone whose status is lower than theirs. Well, like they always, yeah. It's like, does it make you feel like you're a big man? I, I just... But as we were just talking about, everybody's on the same level, yeah, man. Right. Everybody's just trying to do their own job. Don't humiliate that fucking 21-year-old girl no. who's trying to learn. Because you know what? When she's in your position, she'll remember that. This is it. There's been a lot put up with in this industry for a really long time, that kind of hierarchical thing and the, the bullying and the sexual harassment and the kind of like, the just that whole culture of, well, it's just fucking hard. And if you want to do it, you just have to deal with it because if not, there's 20 people waiting around the corner that, you know, it's just enough, man. Like this would not go on in, in other industries. I think the fact that things get enabled, in television particularly, I feel like things get enabled that are not okay. Like I've just had a long conversation with an actress I'm working with that I've known for a long time. Mm. It's quite a bit younger than me. Um, and the and most actor on this production, the in this um, on a night out said, oh, hey, by the way, I'm going to launch myself on you by the end of the night because that's just what guys my age do to girls your age. What? Yeah. And she's got to go and do two emotional scenes with this guy tomorrow. Like, do you know what I mean? And you're like... 
Hmm. She at the time was just like, can we just agree that you won't do that? Like she handled it lightly in the moment. No. No. She told me about it afterwards and I went, okay, is it okay with you if I go and speak to this person? She was like, I don't want it to be weird. I was like, I can wait until you've done these scenes. Yeah. But in the meantime, can we talk to the director about that so that he's aware, just so that you don't shrink in that space because you've got this work to do and I want you to be able to do it. She was like, okay, that's a really good solution. We'll talk to the director together. He'll know. And then, yeah, like you talk to him. So my my feeling is like, I'm going to say something because I don't believe that we the environment that we work in should support that. Mm-hmm. And and that's why this person is doing it. And we've we've allowed, you know, if if we went to the producer and the producer she she'd do it really delicately and she tiptoe around. I'm like, it's not a delicate situation. The only no. thing that's delicate here is this person's ego, yeah. and that's the one thing that doesn't need to be protected. Or that they're so, terrified of this person because of the status that this person exactly. has. And I know I know exactly what you're saying. Uh, yeah. But if. If we, and I'm talking about me, you, that producer, that exec, if we sit back and enable that because of somebody in a, a much more elevated position, mm. status-wise in, in the industry, yeah. to, to me or to you or to Tom, Dick and Harry around there, we let them get away with that. Can't, we can't, You're you tacitly can't do that. supporting the abuse yeah. of other people. Yeah. Like this is her thing she's like I'm like well I can't say anything because I was okay in the moment like I handled it okay and I'm fine I've got a lot of support and I feel fine and I'm like I know but you know what it doesn't matter because there's comments to costume girls and there's comments to you know and it's where does that stop exactly so if I can now say to this person like okay I need to talk to you about something I was told that this happened I know that this happened I know that it was handled lightly in the moment but then days later, this person felt horrible about it. And then she had to come and do scenes with you. Mm. And I'm saying to you, that's sexual harassment. Do not do that again. And if I hear about it again, I will report you myself. Is this what you did? This is what I'm going to do next right. week. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to. And I know what the excuses will be and all of that. But but like... Yeah, because people like that will come back with an excuse. Or, of course. You know, he was if, pissed. If you're pissed and the thing that you do when you're pissed is, is sexually harass your colleagues, out. then don't go out. Yeah. yeah? If, if like, you're just in a really bad place, again, don't go out if that's what it causes you to do. Like, just get your shit together. Know that the culture is not going to support this anymore, and I'm really passionate about that. I'm going to say something, so, you well, know. I, I 100% back you up, and I'm sure everybody tech. listening, you know, you have to do that. And it, it, there'll be, see, there'll be younger actors listening to this, and there's, there's so many different people who listen to these podcasts who are nothing to do with our industry Mm. but the young actors who listen to this you know they should speak up or they should go to someone you know like you or like me or somebody else who they feel that they can talk to and trust who they've got a relationship with so things like this This is it. you don't need to be able to manage this situation on your own if you're that person and that you don't need to be it's not like the responsibility is not on the person the victim in that situation to manage it well it's not like I, because this is the other thing. She, like she, she was like, "Oh, you know, God, what if he comes and apologizes to me?" And then there's a big awkward conversation. I'm like, "That's going to be part of my conversation with him." You can say sorry to her, but you make it brief, and you don't make her responsible for making you feel okay about it. No. Like it's not. You don't need to, as the victim, be responsible for your response. That's the thing that's wrong. You know what they are doing is the thing that's wrong. How you handle it, how you keep yourself, you know, safe and make yourself feel all right. That, you know, that... And also, even those choices of words that he used are quite threatening. Right? Like, that's what I said. That's, that's a threat. For me, Later that's, on, I'm going to launch myself on you. That's unstoppable. You have no power what I'm going to do. I've never even mm. heard someone ever yeah. s- use those type of words. And not only I? that, but hey, it's just what guys my age do to girls like you. And just to This is that. the world, so you're just going to have to learn to live with it, girl. Fuck that. <laughs> Fuck that, right? And also... Hell no. <laughs> we all know that ain't the first time. We all know that. 100%. And sadly, it might not be the last. No. And it might not just be words next time. But, but this is the thing, isn't it? It's like... You can kind of go, well, it was dealt with in the moment and, and you know, but, but, but that's the point. There has to be, something has to stop the, the trajectory of this. 
and if it's if it's somebody going if it's somebody else that wasn't the victim of it that's got the power in that moment to go see that thing that you did do not mm. and i am telling you i'm fucking watching you if i hear a word it's all it's all coming out. all of yeah. it's coming out I, and i am not i am not in a ti- like not in the tiniest bit afraid my career is not in jeopardy by exposing you for that thing right now no, nobody's all. is that's why if no, anybody listens to this no has ever come across like that, they so should say something. They 100%. don't have to deal with that yeah. and repress that and take it home. Mm-mm. No Because how can they begin to deal with it? You've got to and talk. why should you? You shouldn't For have... fuck's sake, it's you not sh- your shit. It's their shit. You should be able to go to work or, or go out and socialise on a job and yeah. with your castmates and not feel that... you are, Wait a minute. So you're going to what at the end of the night? Because that's just what blokes... Fuck off. No way. Yeah, no. No. God, we've started very heavy. I know, Jesus. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to start deep and lighten up. That's my way. I, th- I think that's fine because these <laughs> things, again, these, you pointed out these things need to be discussed. Yeah. I'm so pleased that you, you stand up It's funny up though as well. This. It's like, it's, it's, these, this conversation is so awesome because it's like, it just started where it started because that's where we, I came in the room, that's what I came in the room with. Yeah. And I feel like that is, the be- that that is the best way to communicate. Like, it's like this is what's here right now in this moment. So that's what I'm saying, and and I feel like everything. There's been so much. I think every actor will say this. This of all the things that you don't say, you go into an audition and you have a horrible time, and you don't come out of it and go, "Hang on, that was a really horrible situation actually," because that director was actually really rude, and so of course I didn't do a brilliant job. You know, we don't say stuff. We kind of it's all about our own self management. Do you feel you're getting be. better at saying things? It, say if something happened in an audition, would you feel that you could um, say something? I don't know. I don't know if I'm really at the stage where I would in the moment in the room. I think because I think auditions are still, it's quite heightened and and you're really focused on what you're in the room to do. Like I'm really focused on the material. Um, so I do feel a little bit like Teflon with some of the other stuff, or I think I am like Teflon. It's only like after I've left the room that I'm like, ah, oh, hang on, that was weird, and I didn't feel great about that, and yeah, because you know. That was weird. Like, it, it, I, I'm not necessarily... But also, I think I'm auditioning a lot less than I used to. And I remember when I was auditioning a lot, thinking, I fucking can't wait till <laughs> if there's a day comes along where I don't have to audition for stuff anymore. And it's not like I just get offered loads of shit. Like, I don't. But if you're optioned to a couple of things, you're then your availability's limited and there's yeah. just not that, you know. But also all these conversations take place without me ever going in the room because there's, they've seen this or they've seen that or they've, you know, they know my work on some level. they've worked with you before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the ideal. But when it's not people you've worked with before, like, I would rather go in the room. I would love to meet them. I'd love to get the chance to get the job rather than my agent get me the job or, you know. Um, So I do think that's a loss in a way. I also just, like, enjoy the play sometimes of... But also, you've got to meet these people, because what if you go, well, I read this part, it's a great script, I've been very lucky that they want me to do it. You get there for the first day, he or she's a complete dickhead. Yeah, and and that is the worst. And you go, I've just signed on and I've got to do this, work with this person for the next three months, and they're going to drive me crackers. Yeah. How am I going to do the job to the best of my ability? That's an amazing point, because I feel like this is my big thing now, is like... I don't want to work with people that I don't want to work with. Like, I, I don't want to work with people that are... There's certain things about, like, set dynamics that I don't think work and I don't think make good work. Like, example? Like, um, very authoritarian uh, directors, for example. Yeah. Um, like, I went to Drama Centre and Drama Centre has had, at that time, like, this really authoritarian style. Um, and it scared the shit out of people. Mm. And what they all started to do was emulate the acting of these teachers. Um, that's not freedom. That's not creativity. That's completely the opposite thing. You're, yeah. you're, you're, you're working from a place of trying not to displease someone. And that's not the same thing as exploring the, the depths and, and range of, of humanity. And also that's being, a, what, being allowed the freedom to do that. Yeah. That's just, yeah, like fear, fear totally cripples creativity. So I think that that's a big thing for me. 
um, I just, I, I, I really want to work with people that want, that, that, that see everyone's contribution as equal and valid. And, and I feel like that's the way that the best stuff gets made. And, you know, because the experience of doing it is so much richer, mm. there is, there is the sense that it's like, you know, if this turns out to be crap, like, my God, we've all like really grown from this and we've all really had this amazing experience. Like, that's what I want. There's a there's a thing, like, it's what is different, I think, about theatre from, from doing screen work is that I can't really be that engaged in the product of screen, you know? Like, I don't make that happen. That's created in rooms, you know, that's a medium that's controlled by other people. We, we have no control over the outcome. Exactly, the and what does it matter? Like, I've done plenty of jobs I've never even watched. It's about, for me, it is about the experience of doing it. Yeah. And so I want that experience to be rich. I want to be challenged. I want to learn from it. I want to be pushed. I want all of the things that I like to be stretched a bit and to, and to have to go, oh, hang on a minute, I don't like this. Oh wait, something really cool came out of that. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Like I want that, but um, I don't want it to be easy. I don't want it to be. But I also, I don't want to have a shit time for the sake oh. of. Oh well, it's a really good project. I don't it care. It has to be a fun as well, even if you're I mean, doing something that's deeply emotionally draining. Yeah, right? but that can be some of the most like in like you 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 come away from those days sometimes and you're like, I am knackered. I am like drained yeah. out there is nothing left of me i'm absolutely burst but and fuck also, i feel amazing sometimes you know that you've got that day coming yeah and yeah. you're ticking off your list you're going i'm a bit scared about this day because i don't know if i'm going to achieve what i, I really love want those to days. do they're I my just, favorite days and you never sleep the night before but then you go in and <laughs> after it there's a release because you go right well i can take that page out of my script and i can just yeah. pop it in the recycling because i know that's yeah i really struggle with the days that have light stuff yeah, well, this the sounds hardest. really weird. They're so no, they're, they're so, so hard. hard. They're so hard. It's like uh, all the stuff that's like, okay, your baby's just died, and you're like, you know, like I don't know, whatever. Like something horrific has <laughs> happened to you. It's like, okay, I'm ready. Go, like turn over. I'm fucking yeah, ready. Yeah. But st- when it's stuff like, oh, you know, it's just a bit of a joke, and you know, it's like 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 fluff. I'm like, oh god. I can't do it. But it's kind of so hard I'm to time, invest in that oh, sometimes. And also, so if you go, well, I've got a really light day. And I don't really have that much to say. And it's not going, oh, I don't have anything to say, therefore I'm not... It's not about that. It's no, about it's not, you've got to be in that moment with the, the tiniest bit to do, and that's yeah, really hard that's work. that's really tough. This, that is the thing. The, the, the big, the, the deep emotional work, it anchors you into the moment. Yeah. And I love that. I love that kind of, like, the silence that descends when you're in the middle of that. Like, there's nothing around you but that moment and that person that you're in that moment with. I love that. Like, I feel like I get to the end of it and I'm like, what just happened? I don't remember. Like, I, I love that. That's a great feeling, It's though, the isn't it? bet. It's the absolute bet. What did best. we actually do? Did it, what happened? And they'll remember. come, like, if somebody comes through and goes, that was a really good take, I'll go, I don't know why. Like, I don't know why. I don't know what happened. And also, don't tell me that. Yeah, don't shut up. Fuck off. Tell me that when it's done. Otherwise, yeah. I don't want to know. But also, it's like, you know, we. I think, I think you've got the, you're very much like me. That's the right mindset. I think some people, some are too in that moment, and they're not actually in that moment because they're too busy thinking about what the end product's going to be. Yeah, I and think that's like, really dangerous. <sighs> it's dangerous and, like, to leave your vanity at the door. Yeah, it's also really boring, and you can see it in the work. You you, you really can see it in the work. There's a, there's a thing that... Because um, I think one of the big... The big sort of, like, problems is when people over-prepare. Like, so... I think that... I see this in stuff all the time, big stuff. Like you can often tell when you watch TV drama what was their audition scene. You can spot, <laughs> like, you can spot it a mile. It's really overworked. Yeah. And it's like this is the moment where I cry. This is the moment where I shout. And this is when it's all pre-planned. And I think when things work really well is if you like fling the anchor down into the depth of yourself, stick it in there, and then just let whatever happens happen and listen. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes. There are certain actors, certain... It's just people's different processes. And I think it comes from fear. It comes from, like, I want to get this right. But yeah. when you over-prepare, you sort of... You, you shut yourself off to what might spontaneously happen like in that moment. And that's where the magic is. Like, that... Like, from from not knowing how... You know when you, like... 
actors that like plan how they're going to say everything in a scene and it means that like they start noting you like well you have to do this because I've already planned that oh. I'm going to do that it's like it's, no, it's, no, no. no 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 I'm going to play my character you're going to play yeah. yours and we're going to respond to each other that's what's going to happen yeah. and that's when it's going to be magical years ago I was doing a job years ago and uh just before we were about to shoot this actress came up to me she went did you just do your lines for me now so I know how you're going to do them so I can oh, react no. and I went, <laughs> oh no I went Oh. oh, even though I was still young, I went, uh, no, that's, no, sorry, that's not, I didn't say that's how I work, I didn't mm. say that, but I said, oh, no, that's not really, should we just do it yeah, and then we'll just see what just comes out? Yeah, we just wait and see, yeah. That's why I hate rehearsal. Yeah. I, I know yeah. Some, some actors, it's kind of like rehearsal for TV and film, I don't like it at all. Do I don't want to get I locked totally, in. Totally, yeah, I absolutely know what you mean, I think that can be really dangerous. I think, um, especially when, I think, again, especially when the material's deep, like, just, you know, let's, fine, let's do a line run. Let's kind of say, if you're, like, I love it when a director's like, okay, so this is, like, you know, your big scene. Like, so there's a scene in the Bay where, um, it's like the scene where I go in and confess to him that I have um, lied about knowing this witness, destroyed evidence to hide that, um, lied to my colleagues, and now his wife has found out, so I can't support the family anymore. And you don't see the scene where I actually say those things. You see me standing there and him going, hang on a minute, you did, you know. And it was great when we shot it because I was like, I'm, I'm ready, I'm in the start gate, just you, you know, hit the gun and I'm away, like yeah. I'm ready to go. And the director just went, cool, like, the rehearsal consisted of line run and then, okay, here's what I'm going to do. The camera's going to be there. This is where you're going to be standing. He's going to be sat at the desk. You know, this is, I'm going to have this shot, this shot and this shot. So that's how long you've got to go. That's how much material, like that's how much coverage there's going to be of it. Mm. So, you know, save yourself from this, save yourself from this, keep it for that, keep it for that. And I go, great, I know exactly what I'm doing, sweet. They go, right, turn over, I'm ready. You know, that's the best way. Like, because you, you don't, I don't want to know. I don't want to know whether whether <sighs> he's going to shout at me no. or whether he's going to be disappointed in me. I want to receive it in the moment with the emotional connection that I've already come in with. Otherwise you and just go, can't anticipate it. Oh God, and let it take it where yeah. it takes it. Yeah. And also you don't want to get to the point where I'm just recreating. Oh, it's so, so, I hate that. And I can oh. see that as well. And also... If you're working with someone who's just recreating, oh, it's so dead, find that isn't difficult. It? And you know, then you go, "Well, who am I? I'm not going to say anything to you. I would never dream of saying something to you unless you it was directly affecting." Yeah, I would never. Me. I can't, you, you can't, can't, just you can't mess. Do it, like, you? I would never mess with another actor. I would just no, because that's when you become a dick. Exactly. Exactly. And you know full well that someone's done that to you in the past. Yeah. And, no, and still, also, you know. I know there's been like countless times when I've been in scenes and not present. Like I, 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 I know, and I know that. Most of the time, the reason why somebody's doing that is because they're scared on mm. some level. It's like I, I do kind of fundamentally believe, I mean, this is quite hippy, but I do fundamentally believe that everything that we ever do is driven either from fear or from love. Like it's one or the other end of that. That's what I believe are the two ends of the scale. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that's so ingrained, those insecurities are so ingrained that they become kind of arrogances, kind of like, this is how I do it, and you're, whatever, I'm mm. all over this. Um, and then you're never going to chip through it anyway, so there's no point saying anything. But well, it's a waste of time and energy. Yeah, but I think if somebody's doing that, most of the time it's like, it's because it's cause they're scared, and usually if they get a little bit of encouragement or like a little bit of a note or a little bit of a loosen up, not from me, from a director that cares, Yeah, you start to see... It you know grows. I do think it's a fear thing, or else it's just laziness. In which case, I think case, it is oh, fear, yeah. but I think you know, under the umbrella of fear is their insecurity, mm -hmm. and that can manifest itself as you say as arrogant yeah, or in some nasty ways, slightly nasty or bullying behaviour. You just go, oh. yeah. I had someone watching Wimbledon on his phone once when it was like the reverse, like when it was my close up. He Were was watching joking? Wimbledon on his phone and he had his sides, he just kept checking to read a line and then like watching Wimbledon. I was like, dude. On your turnaround? Yeah, I was like, step out. Like the first AD can read in for you. Like just, I just need an eye line in the words. Like, 
beat it. Yeah. <laughs> Go away. Um, and did the girl? He 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 put the phone down and, and good. Did well, the that's scene. well the good because that would have been the decent thing. Yeah, as if he'd have I mean, off. I said it in the nicest way possible. But I was like, listen, man, like <laughs> I wanted to tell you how it was. We can edit it out later. It's too great, Scott. I was like, listen, too great, like. It's, if you want to go and watch that, that's absolutely fair. I can totally just do this with Stevie. He can read in. Like, it's no bother. Honestly, it would be it would be easier It'd for be me. It would be more helpful. Would, yeah, it yeah. would be a lot easier for me if, like, that's cool, man. Just, that's fine. He was like, oh, no, no, of course I'll, you know. It's like, well, of course. You <laughs> you're saying know. of course now while you're watching Wimbledon. See if the shoe was on the other foot there. Oh, my God. Yeah. That would have been... Ballistic. Tasty. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Talk to me about Glasgow, well, which I love. I it's love the going dear to Glasgow. green place, isn't it? It's yeah. the best city in the world. Um, With some of the greatest food. Some really great food. Do you remember that rec- restaurant that you recommended to me last Nonya, year? Nonya. Oh my it? God. Not long after that, Nonya went <gasps> under. You are kidding me. Yeah. It's kind of devastating. I don't fully know what happened, but. Um, but that was like. They literally, they, they literally one Saturday night went. We've just closed our doors and we're not opening them again. That's it. Uh, you know, I mean, they made sort of an allusion towards Brexit or something. I don't know. It was like the current climate, whatever. But um, yeah, I don't know. Go God, on. that's devastating. Yeah, it's a re- it was really great for A friend of mine was going up to Glasgow this the week that we're recording this and I recommended it to him the other day. I said, you've got to go there. yeah. It was a great, great place. There's loads and loads of great restaurants in Glasgow. Like, it's a real foodie mm. town now. Um, it seems to be growing all the time. Every year that I yeah, go back, yeah. I just go, there's another place that someone recommended to me. Or... Yeah, it's a buzz and it's all spreading. Like, it's, yeah. it's lovely. Um, but how was growing up there? Yeah, um, I... So... Yeah, like, I never thought... When I left Glasgow, I never really thought I'd go back. And... For the years I lived in London, because I was in London for, I think it was like 13 years or something. Like mm. I trained down there and then, uh, so that was three years. And then I did a lot of theatre as well. So, you know, you're not going to move to Scotland and do theatre. Like that's, you can't live on that. Yeah. Um. But I feel like it took me like three, probably three years in London before I felt like I lived there, like felt like it was home. What, after you graduated? Um, or... Probably, it was probably about a year after I graduated that I was like, yeah, this is my city, like, this is, I'm a Londoner. Yeah. And I really loved it for a while. And then I just hit a wall and I was like, oh my God, i got to get out of here. But I never thought I would go back to Glasgow. I used to miss the Highlands, but I never miss Glasgow. Um, and now, yeah, I moved back in 2014, which was... It was related to a bunch of stuff. So I had been married to this guy, um, which was a, a kind of like mad thing that, you know, well, what was it? It was a girl that needed therapy that never had it and like, you know, ended up in a really bad abusive relationship and married him and, you know, whatever. And he lived in Glasgow. And the the major positive I took from that relationship when it was over was that... Um, I finally learned that I don't need to do that. Yeah. And also I got Glasgow back. Right. Um, so I moved back up there 2014, which was the year of the referendum, and I'd kind of set myself, like, I mean, this is a total digression, but I started off as, like, I mean, why would Scotland want independence? This is ridiculous. Fine, have a referendum, say no and get it over with. And then I started learning about it, and I was like, oh, my God. Um, and so I'd kind of set myself, like I wanted to be registered to vote in the referendum. So I wanted to be up the road and kind of in a place by then. Um, and I was really worried because, you know, I my career wasn't in a particularly good place. Um, and But I was really not in a good place and I needed it for myself. Like I needed to get out of London and I needed to be around like the land. Like I really need that. Mm. Did you um, feel you had more of a support network up there, a sort of family or friends? No, actually the opposite, because, like, my closest friends were all people that I had... I had Who were in were London. In, were in London, yeah. Um, but I just, I needed to get away from it, everything being centred around being an actor. Yeah. 
Um, and I needed to get away from just the cityness of it all. And Glasgow, although it's a city, you're at Loch Lomond in 20 minutes. Yeah. Like it's, I just needed, I was craving the land. Like I've always found that really nourishing. I spent a lot of time in the Highlands as a kid and um, that for me has always been, it just right sizes you. It's like you get a sort of perspective. There's a thing about London about having to fight for the tiniest amount of space that just... You, you you lose perspective, you lose the ability to kind of zoom out, or I did anyway. But also, if you're going through the end of a, can I say toxic relationship? Yeah, that be yeah, right? 100%. Yeah. Then if you're in London, even though it does feel massive, you've got so many emotional connections to, you go around the corner, you go, oh, you bump, you always bump into people, and yeah. that has that connection. Sometimes you just got to fucking get out. Yeah, Because yeah. then you, you're free, freer, freer for yourself to stop speaking. To, I suppose to heal yeah you know? and I think there was a, like I was really aware there was a lot of shit I needed to figure out it was like it, not so much about the relationship because I knew why that hadn't worked like it was like it was awful but stuff with you yeah why I'd kept going back to it why why I'd let myself because I knew before I married this person that he was not good for me that right. he was not healthy and that he was not good for me and and throughout the process I kept like there was something and that was what I needed to figure out was like it's not really about the relationship it's not about him it's like what because I can't trust myself right now to make decisions because I made that one what the fuck was that about like I needed to figure it out yeah and I knew that I needed to do that in a place where there was a bit of space um I suppose that's the starting point that you actually ask that question to yourself and you go right why am I doing this and that's what I need to figure out because if you weren't asking yourself that question you might even still be in that relationship. Yeah, or you'd or you'd get out of that one and play it out again in another thing. Like yeah. I do kind of believe that thing where you you'll keep being presented with the same thing over and over again in different ways until you actually figure your shit out, mm. <laughs> figure out what that thing is and deal with it. Um so there was like there was lots of kind of things driving that move. Um Sorry to interrupt did that feel like a, a positive moment for you? to ask yourself that question to go right I'm gonna start on this this journey now to sort things out for me otherwise how can you carry on how can you sort of move forward yeah it did it felt really freeing because I felt really trapped um I felt like I was there because of the job because of the industry yeah and which you don't have to be no which you don't have to be and 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 so that means you're sort of always beholden to what it's giving you or not giving you and, and resentful of it and desperate for it to change. And, you know, and actually it's like, well, hang on a minute. No job is going to change this. No. Because actually you do a job that's great at the time and then you finish it and you've learned a lot from it or whatever. And then you'll have a period of unemployment or like, you know, whatever. Like it is a transient. It's nature is transient. You cannot rely on the joy that the job will give you no. for your joy. No. <laughs> like it's you can, Not and at I all. had been, and that meant that when I wasn't working, I was really unhappy, and when I was working, I was happy, or I was disappointed because I had invested so much in what that was going to give me, and then it wasn't there. Yeah, or you were happy, uh, and still, yeah, but if still you like, really oh. look at it, that doesn't make you happy, and it doesn't make you happy. It's only because you were so low, mm. and then a little bit of what you think is joyful elevates you in a little bit but it's not real it's not real and it's and it's and it's temporary and and you know I'd been doing a lot of yoga and a lot of meditation and stuff like that and just like trying to get to this place where it was like that the sorrow and joy essentially are the same thing like they both feel emotionally open and they both feel that that you're not your your state of well-being is is constant rather than being governed by getting the job, not getting the job, doing the job, not doing the job. What happens on the job? You know, yeah. it's a job. If accountants talked about their work as much as actors do, you'd be like, oh, for fuck's sake. Like if you, if you went to the pub. I, I kind of think like that with, with some actors anyway. I, I always <laughs> think like that with actors. It's yeah. like, oh, shut up. That's why I wanted to get out of London. It's like, I need to have conversations that aren't about this. Yeah. Like, shut up. Like, I remember going to a, oh God, going to a dinner with a good friend of mine. Um, she had kind of arranged this dinner in a, in a pub in North London. And me and my best friend went along, and she's a good friend of both of ours. We'd worked together. 
And um, I have the approach that I have now, having moved out of, you know, and that's, I was coming back in and was there for a bit and was, was at this dinner. And my friend that was with me was kind of like, I don't want to be an actor anymore. And she's like, I'm going to go and do something else. And she was in the process of doing that. And we went to this dinner and there were nine people there or something. And for probably four and a half hours, all that was talked about was self-tapes. Oh, for fuck's sake. Like, like the apps that people use, the lighting that people use. Kill me now. Um, like, yeah, honestly, chop off my fucking head and yeah. set me free. I cannot. <laughs> I cannot. Like, I just, I'm not interested. No. It, this is boring. And if you think in any way this serves your work, you're insane. No, no. You're insane. You have to be living in order for to have something to contribute. Well, like, exactly. What can you bring to the table if that's all you... I mean, on the other side, the flip side of the coin, I do get messages and emails through this podcast about young actors, about mm. what to do, about things like that. And I'll, I'll oh, quite you know, happily give them advice. Yeah. But like, and self-taping is an absolute nightmare. I feel like it is one of the toughest things that actors have to... Because it's an essentially... It's forcing you into a kind of almost narcissistic process where you have to watch your own work back and oh, edit I it. No. I don't anymore. I send no. the takes to my agent and she picks. I'm because like, it, I'm done. I'm, my justification with this is, well, if I'm on a job and I finish a scene, I don't rush around and look at the monitor. Never look to playback in my life. I'm not one of, I don't go for playback, so why would I do that in my front room? Mm. So I just keep it as... It's such a destructive... Process, yeah. I think, and that's the advice that I sort of give people. But I know so many people that do want to watch it, but then again, I know so many people that do playback, and I just have to walk away. It's not yeah. really my cup of tea. I think it really works for some people. I can see why. Mm. You know, there was definitely a well. No, I don't. I don't it, think it works on. Doesn't set. it just fall into doing something with your face that looks pretty? Well, yeah, it falls <laughs> yeah. into the 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 the, <clears throat> the vanity bracket. Yeah, but also they're not watching the scene. Yeah. They're focused on well, what they're, they're doing. doing. Yeah, the self-consciousness. So it's like, yeah, I, th- I think, I think you're right. Be, I don't think it works I on set. I think it can be unhealthy. I think there is a thing where you can... I used to not watch my work because I couldn't watch my own face move. Mm. It was like, oh, God, mm. that was horrible. Um, and then I sort of reached a point where I was like... I watched something and was like, oh, Wow that comes across very differently to what I thought I was doing. Right, yeah. And that was kind of a lesson. It was like, okay, this is something I need to do now. Like, and and I watched it again. And I, I realised that there's there's there's, cert, there's certain habits that I have. And I was like, I, 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 I want to not have those anymore. I want to not rely on things. And that, that was helpful. But that wouldn't work on set. It would just make me really self-conscious. And also you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't be able to, do what you were talking about before and, like, be really in that moment. Exactly. You're too busy thinking about what's going on. And also, there's no fucking time. If everybody there's just no went time, around man. and watched... If we only needed 20 minutes to watch back every fucking take, we did never get anything done. There was there was a director I worked with um, just, just as I was moving up to Scotland that um, this was a... a this guy was a proper turning point. Um, this was a tiny job, right? Mm. Um... I went in and auditioned for this guy with Shaheen Beg and um, Beardra Larson, his name is. He's dead now. Danish director. Um, he was the lead director of The Killing. Mm. And I remember this audition so well. Um, I did a take and Shaheen then sneezed. And he... Um, and she went, I'm so sorry, I was holding that in for the whole take. And he was like... Shaheen, you must never do this. You could die. And we all started to laugh. <laughs> and he was like, don't, why are you laughing? This is very serious, Marvin. This is very serious. And I was like, oh, you know, falling about. Anyway, this guy, this job was quite weird. Like it was direct to camera monologues, but on location. And, yeah. and it was murder. Murder. Yeah. 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 So such a weird concept. And so unnatural to be like looking down the barrel of the lens, you're like, and seeing your reflection and being like, oh, this is horrible. And this was my big thing. I went up and uh, I went and did the job. And um, I remember there was this one scene where like, I really struggled with being able to see my reflection in the camera. I was like, I cannot suspend my disbelief because I can just see myself lying. (laughs) This is absolutely horrible. I want to die. And he just was really like, 
what is your problem? <laughs> like, why are you so weird about this? And I was like, oh God, I don't, I don't know. Ugh, but he couldn't get it. He couldn't. He just was like, just do it. <laughs> just, just do it. There was, there was, there was a scene where I'm like in the car. I'm sitting in, I'm sitting in the driver's seat of my car and the camera's outside the window. So it's shooting me through the window, but I'm talking into the camera, but the window was all, it was slightly steamed up and it was misted with rain and, you know, and then there's a point, the stage directors were so specific on that job. There's a point where I hit the button and let the window go down and 14 takes, 14 takes I did of this where as soon as the window went, I'd go, oh God, the window's got to go down now, go down. And oh, then I'd no. see my reflection, I'd go, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I can't do it, I can't do it. It just sort of like fall apart. And he was really patient for a bit. And then he was like, oh my God, Marvin, just fucking do it. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Why do you hate your reflection? What's the fucking problem? You're lovely, just do it. Like, oh God. <laughs> And he like he said a bunch of things to me. There was that. He was just like, I get it. I get where the sensitivity is and I get what this is, but just fucking believe in yourself and fight through it. Just do it, you know? And it was like, well, that's actually really one of the best pieces of advice I'd ever had. Like, yeah. I acknowledge your sensitivity in this moment. Fucking do, do it, it anyway. <laughs> it's like, yes, absolutely. Fucking do it anyway. But there was another thing that he said. He was like, whenever you... Um, start to experience an emotion you you touch your face you you want like you, you do something with your face try to hide it and he was like I want you to do a take straight into the camera where you do nothing nothing to hide like to hide it you just leave yourself naked and I was like well people don't do that people brush away their tears people and he's like for me do this thing that I am asking you to do for you and it was so profound it's a habit that I have and I'd I had a really logical reason in my head for doing it, but really I was afraid. It was yeah. something that I You're did. You're trying to I justify. Like, yeah, yeah. it's something that I did because I was like a bit embarrassed though it's happening now. Really. And it did just, also just like doing that and having to stare down the barrel of the camera, it just changed the way that I work on set completely. And it, and it was a massive turning point in, in my work. A big breakthrough. <clears throat> and it's funny that sometimes it's just the, the tiniest bit of advice that you would get from somebody and it changes everything yeah and it's like a different outlook it was there was something to do with him not being sort of southern english you know he was just like what is this just yeah fuck this just do it yeah. you know he also he he also he his set was he played music all the time on the oh, set he's one of those is he yeah yeah all the time so <laughs> which i i personally like. i love that <laughs> So he, but nobody does it. No, no one very, fucking does I, it. I've worked with three directors over 20 years that have done it. He's the only one I've ever worked with that's done it. I worked with two guys who used to direct as a team. Friends ah. who direct as a team. And between takes, they put, they put all the sound system in and they had Love it all it. hooked up. And they would take, well, what, what mood are we in? Or we think we're going to do this. Yeah, right, yeah. Let's put a bit of this on. So everybody's working. In yeah. this amazing environment with all this music pumping out. And if you need to go and have a bit of quiet time, then you could just yeah. fuck off and go and have that. Yeah, but, yeah it's easy to do. It's very know, easy to go and find quiet. Everybody can do their work. Yeah. But that's how they work. It's and I so love it. Great it brought for so crew. much energy. So yeah. great for the crew. So great for crew. Just, yeah, the energy thing. Nobody's bored. Beardy would do things where, like, he would put music on. Like, he'd have it while they were setting up. He'd be, like, play Elvis or, like, you know, mm. something that's, like, Woo, and everyone's just having a really good time. And then, like, <laughs> so he decided, he was, like, I want you to think of her as a predator. You're a predator. And I was, like, okay. And he's, like, action. This is on a rehearsal. And he pressed play on his boombox. And I was, like, do 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 The fucking Jaws theme. I was, like, <laughs> you're a genius. And I, like, I wanted to laugh. But I was, like, nah, just go with it for a second. It's, like... Yeah. Mm. Uh, do you know, like, just that, just that freedom, that playfulness of kind of like, let's all stop being all sort of television about it. And this is the moment where I do the thing. And let's just like fucking, we're not, we're making stuff that people watch for entertainment and exploration and, you know. And to escape. To escape, yeah. It's, it's not, we're not heart surgeons. We're artists. Let's stop. You know, it's also top heavy now, isn't it? Execs and fucking, you know, bleh. everyone's trying to, directors are ticking boxes for producers and execs and writing. Yeah. Bleh, bleh, bleh. Yeah. But, you know, we're meant to be making art, right? Like, that's what it's. 
It's supposed to be four. So let's just let's do something really simple. I know it's very controversial. Let's just take the pressure away. Mm-hmm. And then everybody can relax yes. and we can try and do a really fucking good job. Let's do that. But I'm a big believer in shit like that bleeds down. Yeah. So if there's pressure from the top, it ripples. Oh, right? yeah, yeah, and yeah, if you there's, can't. And if there's fear from people up high, then that's tense. Mm. Then that tension comes down and then eventually comes out to everybody. And it comes out in... Probably a first day detail and a runner to get the fuck off a set. That's exactly it comes from somewhere. Exactly, someone's get it's a knock on effect. Yeah, if exactly. there's fear or there's pressure or there's worry, it does come. And I yeah. think if you've got that from the top and it's not there, happy, I happy totally days. agree. I think one of the biggest skills that you can learn as an actor is like to notice when that's going on and find a way to sort of. Put like put a bubble around yourself and your work so that you can still deliver it without that really, because this is the thing is like everything shows on your face when it's up close. Everything comes through. It it might not be clear what it is, but it's all there as a kind of like little poisonous little thing in your mm-hmm. work. You've got to find. I did this really random job right <laughs> um, when I was just out of drama school that Dennis Hopper was in. Right, it's a fucking weird film, right? Bad. B movie. I think they were basically laundering money by making films, and they made probably some... not the first time. Nah, <laughs> and and not the last. <laughs> and uh, Dennis had made some sort of deal with them. I think where like, oh, if you if you be in this film, you can you know direct a film and you know whatever. And he was like, yeah. So he was playing an Irish priest, but he was only Irish in some scenes. Some scenes he just couldn't be bothered, and so he was still just American. So that was weird. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> nothing like continuity. <laughs> nothing like continuity. But it's Dennis Hopper, so nobody's going to say fault. shit. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, but I had this like it was one Sunday we were off, and I ended up smoking weed with him in his hotel room. Him and his assistant, who's this Native American guy called Satya, which means truth, right? And Satya just sat there and like chain rolled spliffs, right? While Dennis like fucking gave me stories. And his stories were about like the actor's studio and Lee Strasberg and yeah. like, my teacher, my the only teacher that I truly loved at Drama Center was a Strasberg associate. So mm. um I wanted all of those stories. Of he was in class with Dennis, that that was what I wanted to hear about. And he said, Jimmy Dean said to me, I was like, oh, fuck, <laughs> am I really high or is this actually happening? <laughs> Jimmy Dean said to me, you got to become like a giant sequoia. Do you know what a sequoia is, Morvan? And I went, no, and he went, it's a tree. It's got this really, really pure, pure wood. If anything gets in through the bark, it poisons the tree and the tree dies, right? I was like, okay. He's like, you got to become like a giant sequoia. you got to build this really thick bark around yourself. you got to open it up. Let that pureness come out and you've got to close the bark back up and protect it. You've got to keep yourself protected so the work stays pure. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to take Jimmy Dean's advice. <laughs> I'm wrong with and that. And your stoned <laughs> advice. And I'm going to remember that for the rest of my fucking life. And I remember cartwheeling when I, when I got on the corridor when I came out of his room. I was like, holy fuck, I just came out of drugs. Killed Dennis Hopper's just told me a story over weed about fucking Jimmy Dean and being a sequoia. So that's my wisdom about Bubbles and, on set. And are you getting better at being a sequoia over the years? Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. But it's, I, I think for me it's been about softening. Like I think I had a natural guardedness that, that probably didn't help me. Which would manifest itself as what? Well, I kind of like... Anger? Yeah, like turned inward depression really. Um, like I kind of... I just would isolate myself, like shut myself off to things and mm. and sort of like, there's something really funny about being an actor and doing these kind of things on, on set and in plays where it's like, right, okay, I need to go into my bubble now and put my headphones on and listen to music so that I can get into this emotional state where I do a crying scene. It's like, actually, no, I don't need to do that. Mm. I can continue to, I can be mindful of where I am and what I have to do and be connected to that and still softly talk to the people that are doing checks on me and softly talk to the runners and softly talk to, and not, be like get away from me. like I don't need you to stay away I'm fine mm. I'm ready I can do my job like you know it is a softening for me um a, a trust of what's inside and my ability to get to it and and a trust that I'll be okay when it's done yeah you know I think when you've done a bit of work in yourself there's loads of people do this thing it's not just actors like all artists 
I've heard this thing happen where it's like, if I was to sort my shit out, if I was to do this work on myself, I wouldn't be able to be an artist anymore. Oh, and where would it all come yeah, from? Yeah, it's yeah. absolute yeah. nonsense. When you do that work on yourself, you can go way, way deeper and you know you're going to be okay. Yeah. You're not in danger ever. No, because you've got the skills to protect yourself after it now because you've yeah. done that work. You know you're fine. <clears throat> but it's those people who go, yeah, but um, if, I, if I didn't have this trauma, then I wouldn't be able to deliver yeah. this intense work. But that's only probably because they're scared of actually looking at themselves exactly. and, and admitting and doing a bit it's of work. It's an excuse. It, it is really an excuse. is an excuse. It's like the smoker's the excuse is. of going, oh, but I wouldn't have this lovely voice if I didn't smoke. Well, yeah. you would. It's, yeah, you would. <laughs> you're, just, you're just addicted to thinking, yeah, mate, you would. to be honest. You're just like a fan. Yeah. 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 It's, and the thing is, you always have the things that happen to you. It's just that you can access them without living still in that trauma. You can dip in and come mm. back out into mm. a healthy place. Like, mm. it's just... It's a no-brainer, really. Also, it's just a better life. I mean, I don't quite know how we got here. You asked me about Glasgow, and I'm like talking about sequoia trees. Look, hell. this is why I love doing these podcasts because <laughs> we can go everywhere. So let's just <laughs> let's just jump around again and let's go back. So we're leaving London. Yep. And it was the right thing to do to get out of there, go back to Glasgow. Hundred percent. And is that when you you thought, right, this is where I'm going to start doing some work on myself? No, I'd kind of been doing stuff on and off. Like I'd been doing stuff in London. Um, yeah, and then um, and then I met that guy, and then I stopped doing work on myself because it was like, well, I won't be able to stay in this if I'm still staying present because it's that bad. Shit. Um, and then yeah, and then I sort of picked it back up once I got myself out of that. But um, but Glasgow was more about like I'd done a lot of that in London, a lot of like. It's not just like I've done bits of therapy, not huge, huge amounts of therapy, but lots and lots of like yoga, meditation. Like I did yoga teacher training. That was one of the big and the process of that two year thing. The self exploration of that was like massively profound. Um, but when I moved up to Glasgow, it was a strange thing because I think I thought this is going to have a really negative impact on my acting career, but I didn't. My acting career wasn't in a good place anyway, so I was like, I just need to look after myself. I need to give myself a life that I want to live. Yeah. I was living in this little flat in Tottenham that I'd had for um, seven years, and yeah, it had gone up in value, but so had everything else. I was never going to. I felt like I was never going to get out of this one bedroom flat in Tottenham. And I needed to. I'd been burgled there three times. I just had loads. The place was just like riddled with bad memories for me. Yeah. It was a nice wee flat, but I was done. Mm. Like, you know when you're just done? Mm. Um, and I was like, I just, I want to live in a tenement flat in Glasgow. I just want to go home. Like, I'm done. So um, what actually happened was I got up the road and I think that sense of freedom and that sense of kind of like, actively unplugging myself from the industry which is like London to me was like it was all centered around work stuff well, because everybody is. I knew there was <clears throat> you know I didn't grow up there like everybody I knew in London I knew through work yeah um and and also even if you're not meeting people or you're not talking about it or nothing's really going on it's still there it's still and there it's, and it's kind of all that you're thinking about and you, you'd be right, you need to unplug. Yeah. You need to make that decision and get away. Otherwise yeah, it-, it was just like, you know, I just, I started to think about the reasons why I wanted to be an actor. And it wasn't from being around actors and talking about acting. It was from watching people and feeling like, and reading books and like really loving like the the kind of like, okay, so I sort of fundamentally believe that we have all got all of the same things inside us and it's like a big massive sound desk and things are turned up and turned down and and that's the process of finding character for me is like I can I can be like oh I don't think that's in me like I just do not identify with that at all and then if I really drop every defense and I really like go there I'll find it even if it's tiny and then turn it up, turn it up, turn yeah. it up, turn it up, turn all the things down. And that's that's what it is for me. Like, that's what always, that was what fascinated me. That's why I became an actor. I was doing that with, that's why I loved books that were all like first person narrative, kind of like verity film, like um, singular POV, like the depth of a person. Because always I would find something that resonated with myself, even if they were wildly different from me. Yeah. Um, 
So this thing of sitting around talking about the industry and that audition and this audition, it's like, I don't care. And the thing is, being around this is making me care and that's making me feel really unwell mm. and I need to get away from it. So if it's not going to be that for me, if it's not going to be what I, what I wanted to do this for, then I should probably start thinking about what else I might like to do. Was there a moment where you <clears throat> genuinely, seriously thought, I'm going to stop doing this? There's been a good few times, Have Craig, a... yeah. There's been a few. Um, yeah, I would say, so I graduated in 2003 and we're 2019 now. I would say in that 16 years, there have been four or five proper like six month to one year periods where I've gone, I do not want to do this anymore. What do I want to do? And the thing is, fundamentally, I've always ended up coming back to it because it's the industry that I don't like. It's not the work. It's not my job. Mm. It's this other shit. Yeah, but if that, if that other shit directly affects what you do mm. for a living... Right. And it's making you... And it makes anybody would make it's made me unhappy in the past and if it mm. gets to that point where it's an unhealthy happiness mm. that's interrupting what you do on a daily basis you've got, got to fucking you've make got a, a step, change you've got to make a change exactly it's like i've watched so many people rely on this for their happiness it's like it's not going to give it to you it's it's actively going to take it away mm. if you give it that power and beat you down yeah, yeah yeah and there's other places like if that's if fundamentally that's what it's about for me there's other places i can put that there's other things i can do with that um and i can find them i will find them if this is so damaging that you know um and sometimes it came from, like, there were a couple of times it came from working with a particularly horrific actor. Like, there was one actress that I worked with that was, I mean, just a monster. Like, I just watched a crew of 60 people on day one of a six-month job be, like, really buzzing. And by 10 days in, they Broken. were like, yeah. oh, fuck, we've got six months of this, you know? It was horrifying. Um, did, that other, did that directly affect you personally or impact your work, that other person's behaviour? Or did you just I think, see everything I think, around? Crumble? I think the the atmosphere that it created did. Right. Um, I actually, the only time that she actively did something to me in a take, I I said, <laughs> "You can't do that." Like I would never laugh in your face in a take. That's crazy. You can't get away with that. Like, can we just go again? Like. Um, and she was like, she blamed someone else. Like she did a kind of thing. And it was like, cool, like whatever, but can I, I'm going to do another one now if that's okay. Like, um, because you weren't intimidated and you took control there, but you know. Yeah, I, th I think I in was intimidated. And because I was intimidated, I was like, I'm going to really fuck my work here. And that's exactly what she wants me to do. So I can't do that. Well, I imagine if to. that happened to somebody who was even more brittle. And they didn't have the voice to do that. Then yeah. that would have directed. That would have directly impacted what oh, they yeah. do. I mean, I needed three takes after that because I was like red and of like you, yeah, yeah. you know, I was a mess. Yeah. But well, that's, that's, I'd said it. And that's natural. Yeah, you're human. Yeah, I was like, cool. I'll be mm. okay with that. She was more embarrassed than I was, so it was like, it was fine. But but yeah, it's it's always been more like stuff like that. And now, like now, I feel like the industry is changing. I feel like the culture is changing. I feel like um, there's a lot of work to do, for sure. But, um, but do you think it's heading in a positive, a more positive direction? I do. I worry about... Um, I worry about the kind of cynical... I've seen a little bit of, of kind of... the manipulation of those things like like you know it's really uncool to be a misogynist now right <laughs> like you really get called <laughs> out on that shit but so I'm quite aware now that there's quite a lot of misogynists working that have managed to that are clever enough to sort of present themselves as kind of feminists and actually are sort of covertly doing this like that the, there's a manipulate there's quite a sort of yeah and I, so I'm aware of that um but I also think we've never been in a time where um, it's been easier to go, 
hey, hang on, that thing that you're doing, that's not okay. Like, it's never been better, it, it can get a lot better than this, but it's never been better than it is now for that, I think. And that can only be a good thing, right? That's got to be the right direction. Well, as long as more people pipe up mm-hmm. and don't just walk away at the end of the day or say to somebody when they get home, oh, so this shit happened at work today, yeah. why didn't you say anything? Yeah. Should You can say, you know... The door's open, we just that's, need to walk through know, it. That's so, like, not just a, an acting thing, though. That's, like, a human dilemma, isn't it? Like, yeah. you see something, you see a fight in the street, and you go, fuck, I should have... Like, just before I came in, in here, there was a guy, this old man, he had, like, a tiny little dash hound on a, on a lead, mm. right? And he was like that, yanking it. And I went, don't do that. Like, it came out like a reflex. Don't do that. And he went, mind your own fucking business. And I was like, oof. And I just kind of, like... Like that that was it, that was the end of the exchange, and then yeah. I rung you, and that was that, but like that was a result of like three days ago, I was out walking my dog on the weekends with my friend, and a guy walked past us with a big German shepherd on a lead, and he was going like this, pulling it in, pulling it in, and as my dog went past, the dog kind of pulled on the lead and barked, and he punched it twice, and I didn't say anything. Oh. he went thud, thud, and I was like, "Oh my God, but I didn't say anything to him. That's shocking. And the next time I said, and then it, but it came back. It came yeah. back three days later. Yeah. I walked past a guy with a tiny little sausage dog on a lead going yank, yank. And I went, don't do that. And yeah, he told me to go fuck myself, but he heard it. Yeah, yeah. You know, like I, I do think this is, it's not just like our industry and acting. It's just being human. It's like finding your voice and like. But that's it. It's exactly what it is, finding your voice. But as you said before, I think sometimes people are so worried that it's going to ha- impact their yeah. fucking career. <clears throat> and you know, Well, it- of course, because they've con- been conditioned to believe anything you have right now can be taken from you in a second, you yeah. know? And it can, probably, but fuck it. Who cares? Is it worth having if, like, I don't know. No. Th- that's, that's, I guess, the place that I got to. I was like, is any of that worth having? And I don't think so. No. So, but and actually what it. I have now is way more. Yeah. You know? But I do, I do think you have to reach a point of... I definitely reached, on a number of occasions, a point where it was like, I have hit the wall, I am done. I don't want to do this anymore. So either it has to change or I have to change and it's not going to, so I have to. And also, you've got no control over that. You have, con- you have control I over you. have control you. over me, that's it. That's all I can do. That's all I can do. So, yeah, I... I um, it's funny though because like I write now and I would really love to direct and I think that will happen at some point in the future but weirdly I was like I don't want to act anymore I want to do this stuff and the more the the work the acting work that I've done since then has been more rich and more um like nourishing more kind of rewarding to me than anything I ever did before so yeah I think that's quite interesting is it funny when you you make a a conscious decision like that and then all of a sudden, the stuff that you don't have any control starts falling into your lap. And you yes. go, oh, wait a minute, I didn't even ask for this, and it's just come to me. Yeah, yeah. But you don't really know what you're pushing away from yourself when you're, I don't know, when you're, when you're sort of not in, I, yeah, I don't know. I think I've watched it happen with lots of girls, you know, and I, like, I'm big into looking after young actresses now. It's like a massive, massive thing for me. Um, like throwing the ladder down, like mm. come with me, come with me. Yeah, it's a big thing because I feel like you, you, you're made to feel so disposable, and it's, and you are, like to to the industry, you you sort of are. It's just it, you've got to know in yourself, like that you're not, that you're not. Because if you start to believe that, it's going to have a real impact exactly on, on yourself and exactly. your own self-esteem exactly and the truth is that you know if you get in those rooms and you and you go you, you have these auditions there's lots of factors that come into you know it's become you hear these things all the time you just don't look great or you know they're they're looking for a certain kind of look or you know you're essentially here what you're hearing is i'm not pretty enough or i'm not this or I'm, you know i actually had like the head of the BBC at this particular moment in time say she is not sexy, she is not a BBC lead, she will never be on the on the cover of the Radio Times. And when I got that feedback, I was like, "Holy shit, what do I do with that?" Yeah, like you know, 
but actually, oh hey, I have been on the cover of the Radio Times. Oopsie. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so like, yeah, it, it just it everything about this is subjective, right? So yeah. you're going to come across people that don't like your work, don't like your face, don't like your whatever. And the truth is, the chemistry of each, like the kind of alchemy of each role in each production, is a lot more than just like how you read in your audition or whatever. It's so yeah, much more than that. You can only control one element. So take that and do the best with you can with it and fucking forget the rest. It doesn't matter. Like, it, it doesn't matter because there's absolutely nothing that you can do about it. It just is. Yeah. You know? Don't try and get, take that control because you're never going to have it. And you keep, it's like striving for something that's going to make you happy in the job. And yeah. It, and it might do for 20 minutes. Just Yeah. Try and look after yourself as a person, and yeah, then you've got to be job. okay. Yeah. like that's that's fundamentally what it is. You've got to be okay. Um, Do you think you're okay now? Oh, I'm. Yeah, because <laughs> you see, you seem to me very, very rooted in who you are. Yeah, I am. I think I think I've kind of I always have been to some extent, like, but I think I am. I'm happier than I've ever been. Um, and which, that's a which, is, which is a massive, massive... It's, ev- massive, it's, it's everything, massive. isn't it, really? It's everything. Yeah, but that's a lot of factors that are sort of that are sort of in that. But it's also just, like, getting older as well. I'm 41. Like, I'm not, I'm not 23 anymore. I'm not going, oh, do I look nice in this dress? I don't care. Like, whatever. I'll wear yeah. my trainers. I don't give a shit. Like, I, I just... I think... I think also... I went through... Like, there was a whole cla- like class thing because... So when I was growing up, we were sort of quite a middle class family. And then my parents, when I was quite young, when I was like five or six, they, um, something happened in the family and bankruptcy and lost the house and blah, blah, blah. And we moved to this council estate. And there was this really strange thing where like to the people that lived in the council estate, we were kind of the posh family. But to like the where I went to school was quite a middle class area. And to, right. so to all the kids at school, it was like, they're the ones from the council estate. It was just really weird, like sort of dichotomy Mm. and it felt like um like I always had to hide where I was from a bit and because of judgment yeah yeah like I remember like this is so random but it's amazing that it stayed in my head I think I was like eight years old or something primary school and there was a girl that I was friends with and we used to like do this thing like girls do like oh do you want to come to Main Street from school and she had said, do you want to come from straight from school and you can stay for tea? And I was like, oh, great. And she was like, do you need to ask your mum? And I was like, I didn't need to ask my mum because we were at home on our own when we got home from school. So I didn't, it didn't matter where I was. So I was like, yeah. So I went the next day. And then I would never invite people back. Like I would never do the return invite because I didn't want to bring people to my house. And I turned... Because well, of what? Because you felt embarrassed? Yeah, there was a whole, there was a whole like... There was a whole, it, it wasn't like where the house was, it was the state of the house inside. My parents were like, I think it, they just went through a really, really hard time when that all that happened. Yeah. And um, the house was just always a mess. There was stuff like they, they'd pulled wallpaper off walls and never replaced it. Like uh, it just, it just was a mess. It was always a mess. Um, there was always dirty dishes like stacked up on the coffee table. If you were sitting watching TV, you were watching it over a stack of dirty shit, you know. But yeah, so there was, there was always this thing of like, I never wanted people to come to my house. And um, and I did this thing where I tidied up, like I really like tidied up the house, cleaned up the house so mm. that I could go and return the invitation. And I said, oh, do you want to come to mine straight from school? And she was like, oh, I'll ask my mum. This is pre-mobile phones, you know. Yeah. She's like, I'll ask my mum. And she came into school the next day and she went, oh, my mum says I can't come because you live in a council house. And <sighs> I've never forgotten it. It's weird the things that stay in your head. Yeah, of course. But it's like... That, that, this nation is so obsessed with class. Like, yeah. it's, it's, honestly, it's ridiculous. And definitely when I moved to London and went to drama school and then started working in classical theatre, that was a big fucking problem because I felt like an alien and I felt like I needed to hide where I'd come from. Um, and now I don't. Yeah. <laughs> so that is profoundly why, you know, I'm just very different now than I was then because I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to fit, fit in, in with, with something I'm, I'm f- like I don't need to be part of your daft gang. gang yeah 
I think it's a bit gross. But I think we all, I think we, uh, a lot of us all felt like that. Yeah. At, like it's early 20s. It's been 20s. a big thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's been yeah. a huge thing. Massive thing f- for me as well. I didn't mm. want... It's in, and also, I, felt, I used to feel very intimidated. Me too. That I wasn't um, intellectually on, on their level. But you know, this is the big thing, right? Go on, is that I do not believe that to be the case. I think... Right, I did this play. Um, that's how that's how they made me feel. That, that's totally. That's what that's what they are trying to make you feel. So I did this thing called the Bridge Project, right? That was um, two classical plays, a Chekhov and a Shakespeare. Sam Mendes was directing it. It was half an American cast yeah. and half a British cast. And yeah, we did uh, New York, and then mm. we did Old Vic. We did a bit of a world tour, and Rebecca Hall was on that job, and she's a wonderful person. Rebecca grew up, um, you know, Peter Hall's daughter. She went to Rodine, she went to Cambridge and halfway through Cambridge she went, I don't want to be part of this train that I'm unstoppably on, so I'm out. And she walked out of Cambridge. And I remember starting the Bridge Project and at the stage where you're kind of sat around the table and it was just a bunch of... It was really interesting because the American actors were more of the kind of method, not the wanky method which means I can just be a cunt to everyone and and call it method (laughs) actual method actor studio method Strasbourg method Stanislavski method and then the English actors were all stuck up here you know talking about iambic pentameter and where the punctuation is and and I'd kind of go but hang on a minute like what folio are we working from because it's different like it changes like if we're looking at a Shakespeare play like it changes in different like the first folio version and what we're looking at now aren't the same. So how can you say that that comma means this because it wasn't there in the first place? Yeah. I don't know. Like I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Like you know, and I got shot down daily. I got lectured on the 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 structure of Shakespeare from them. Yes, from <laughs> from Sam, from you know Sam Russell Beale, from you know not like. And some of it, they were they were tempted to be generous, but they were they were tempted to be generous from a place of knowing that they were much more intelligent than I was, and yeah. that, you know. And um, and I remember having this conversation with Rebecca ages later, but she said to me the thing about she was like I, I said I, I find it very difficult. These I'd had these conversations with Ethan that was in the company as well that was American. Um, I was like I just. I feel like they're going out of their way to make me feel dumb. And he's like, they're doing the same thing to me. It's not intentional, but they're doing it to me all the time. And Rebecca said this thing to me that I've never forgotten. And I'm going to say it to you because nobody should ever forget this. She said, it's not that the people at those schools and those universities are the smartest in the world, but they are taught to believe that they are the smartest in the world. They are taught to believe that their opinion is going to be the right one in the room. And that's what that that's what I was experiencing. People going, <laughs> we're right, you're wrong, but bless you, like we'll help you. I'm giving you all my love and generosity and support because we know, and y- you sadly don't. It's snobbery. Yeah. It's not anything more than that. It's not intellect. There's intelligent people in that room, but I'm also intelligent. I'm mm. also articulate. It's so are you. It's not about that. It's about. There's so, so much more I want to talk to you about. I know, right? <laughs> but <laughs> I, th- I think that's a really nice place to end for now. Word. Um, <laughs> but I think we should probably have another conversation at some point. We totally but should. I don't think we can leave it over a year this time. No, let's not do that. Let's have another combo. Marvin, thank you so much. Such a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I've wanted to do it for ages. It's been been nothing short of brilliant. I've loved it. Mate, I've loved it too. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And another episode is done. I mean, come on. Yeah? If we're going to have a break and we're going to come back. This is the type of episode that we want to come back with and I couldn't be more pleased. It was a real, oh God, what passionate conversation we were having. And I, I really hope you enjoyed the stuff that, that, that came up that we were discussing because um, I think these conversations need to happen and I don't think they happen enough. Uh, but this is where we have those conversations and I'm really pleased that you're joining us. And look... 
we're going to see you next Thursday. We're back on track, okay? So if you're not up to date, look, it's fine. But go back. Uh, who've, who've you missed? Kevin Bishop. You want some positivity in your life? Joe Sims, Vicky McClaw, Adrian Dunbar. Beautiful episode. So many um, that I'm really proud um, that myself and Griff have brought you because we really love having them and I know that you love listening to them. So a massive thank you. And while I'm saying a thank you, I got a lovely letter uh, from a listener. She's called Fran. And I think she was maybe slightly concerned about me um, and where I was. And she told me that she'd taken up knitting um, to help her, to, to help her relax and deal with, with any issues that she was having. And the quite wonderful Fran um, knitted me a scarf. And it's absolutely gorgeous. Obviously, it's boiling up in here in Manchester. I'm not wearing it at the moment. But Fran, I've said thank you, but I want to say a massive thank you uh, on this episode to you because it's a, a lovely kind thing that you did uh, and, and do you know what i really like the scarf it's ace so fran thank you so much right i won't bother you anymore i think we'll probably get off so look until next week just look after yourself and um yeah i'm beaming i'm i'm, I'm smiling because we're back and, I, and i'm really thrilled to be back so until next week i've been craig parkinson he's been producer griff and this has been the two shot podcast take care The Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson, recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. Cheers. <laughs>